Welcome to the second presentation about our burial grounds. Most of you know us. I'm Wendy Kane, and this is Sharon Houlihan, and we are the meeting's burial ground liaisons. But Marge Burden has lovingly named us the Graveyard Girls. I'd like to start by giving you an overview of what we'll be talking about today. We'll begin with general information about the burial grounds, followed by a walk through the four sections that make up the graveyard. We'll go a little bit into our day-to-day -day work and then spend most of our time talking about our legacy of friends, friends who are in our burial ground that Sharon and I have gotten to know and whom we'd like to introduce you to or remind you of. So when Phil Getty stepped down from the position in 2016, Sharon and I stepped up. He passed along a box of unorganized folders, cards, and assorted papers and CDs that he inherited from his predecessor. There was also a rumor that there was very little space left for burials. Where to begin? First, we moved all the records to a Google Drive so the digital files were accessible to both of us. Many of the records did not have complete birth and death dates, so we used our genealogical sleuthing skills to gather primary documents. That led us to finding about 79 friends who were listed as being buried in our graveyard in other primary documents, but were not in our records. They are now. We have photographed all of the headstones and Sharon has spent countless hours updating and uploading records to find a grave. Finally, we have streamlined and improved our reservation process. As we began this journey, one of our main concerns was the inconsistency of the record keeping because we wanted to do things the right way. But as our local grave digger and mentor, Ted Burgess has told us, there is no such thing as a perfect graveyard. This has become our mantra. And this is our friend, Ted. Let's start with some fast facts. The burial ground is laid out in four sections. Jacob Janney was our first burial in 1820. Out of the 614 burials that we have been able to identify, there are 34 veterans, nine conscientious objectors, two centenarians, and 57 children. Now, let me take you on a walk through the burial ground. Section 1 East was opened in 1820, and it is our oldest section. It's laid out in nine rows with about 39 plots per row, but this is just an estimate since this is a section with the fewest headstones. Our two most famous friends, Edward Hicks and Michael Hutchinson Jenks, more on him later, are buried in this section. We assume that this section is full. Section 1 West was established in 1861. The layout was changed from rows to lots. The reason why is lost to history. Each lot could accommodate four burials and the lots were assigned to families and no cost to them. There are plots available in this section for both full size and urn burials. Section two was established in 1932 and is also laid out in lots. Initially, the lots were assigned to families, but the meeting began charging $25 per plot or $100 for a four plot lot in 1955. The okay. price for a plot in this section is now $750 for meeting members. 
And this is the section where we direct people who would like a full-size burial in a coffin. The newest section, section three, was established in 1983. It is our urns only section and it has the most availability. It is laid out in half lots and flat headstones are required. The price for a plot here is $375. There has been inconsistent management with this section. And if you walk over there, you can find headstones that are not flat to the ground. Just a few words on record keeping. Since we were a preparative meeting for many years, our earliest burial records were kept by our different parent meetings, mostly Makefield and Middletown. Records have always been kept by volunteers and every volunteer kept records in a different way. Sharon and I have moved our record storage into the 21st century by creating an online database and storing it on a Google Drive. But we also have a very organized system of paper files. Why both? <laughs> because we're just not ready to go completely digital. And because we wanted to get to know these friends as more than just birth and death dates, we conducted research on Ancestry.com, newspapers.com, and search the military records on fold3.com. We also visited the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, the Newtown Historic Association, and explored the George School and AFSC archives. Another responsibility of ours is maintenance of the headstones. We consulted with the National Park Service for advice on how to safely clean the plant matter off of them. They suggested a product called D2, which continues to repel biological matter long after it has been applied. Just look at the difference between the before and after pictures of Iva Swigard John's headstone. We've assembled a wagon of cleaning tools to make the cleaning process more efficient and we take before and after cleaning pictures. Finally, we are trying to address the numerous headstones that are sinking or tilted. We hope to talk about that work at our next presentation. Well, that's a brief description of some of our day-to-day -day work. There is much more, including taking care of reservations and coordinating burials, but right now, we want to talk about our legacy of friends. Let's dig into the records and get to know some of the meeting members that have done incredible work and lived incredible lives. We want to make them come alive for you as they have come alive for us. Let's begin with friends who were part of the George School staff and faculty. Leon Baker, began his service as George School's chief engineer in 1947. He made permanent drawings and records of the school's infrastructure, assuring proper maintenance into the future. Leon retired from George School in 1975. After being interviewed by George Walton in June 1939, Bill Burton, father of Ken Burton, started teaching physics the following fall. Upon release from his conscientious objector civilian public service under the auspices of AFSC, Bill Cleveland came to George School in 1946, serving as director of religious studies and director of the theater arts program until his death. Robert Lee Cook went to Westchester State Normal School and then taught mathematics at George School from 1908 to 1933. He also coached tennis, swimming, baseball, and soccer. William Cooper was a maintenance employee at George School from 1917 until his retirement in 1949. Brucia Dedinsky 
taught French at George School for 25 years, retiring in 1961. She began her education in a gymnasium in Russia and later studied in Germany, Switzerland, France, and England. She was fluent in Russian, French, Italian, Spanish, German, and English. Steve Fletcher graduated from George School in 1928 and returned to teach algebra after graduating from Penn State in 1932. In 1935, he helped make a complete inventory of George School's trees and shrubs. Grant Frazier taught math. He carried a large old fashioned briefcase with metal runners on the bottom. Before each class, he would stand unseen right outside the door and launch the briefcase across the front of the room. The briefcase would zing on the hardwood floor all the way to the opposite wall, bounce off, and land. He would then enter the room and class would begin. Helen Lovett received her master's in library science from Rutgers University in 1969. She was the George School librarian for many years. Elizabeth Metzel came to George School as a substitute French teacher and was later chair of the French department. She frequently played the piano in assembly and in meeting for worship. George Nutt was a manual training instructor from 1893 to 1936 and was a member of the first faculty at George School. In 1912, he was named vice principal of the school and upon his retirement, vice principal emeritus. Ernestine Robinson came to George School in 1943 as chair of the English department and a journalism teacher. She was described as having the gift of inspiring her students. Palmer Sharpless was the head of the Department of Arts at George School, where for 38 years he taught woodshop, graphic arts, technical theater, and drafting. Amelia Swain was an English teacher and George School's pioneer in musical theater from 1914 to 1917. When her five children were grown, she returned to teach religion from 1943 to 1945. Her son, Kingdon Swain, was born and raised on the George School campus. He served as the school's archivist and historian and is the author of George School, the History of a Quaker Community. Finally, Mary G. Wilson, fondly known as Aunt Polly, served George School as postmaster for 24 years. Having grown up on a farm, she brought her green thumb with her, serving as the unofficial school decorator for years. Now that you've gotten to know some of the George School community, let's dig deeper into one of George School's headmasters, George Walton. George Walton had a big life. The impact he had on George School, its students, the faculty, and the future of the school is immeasurable, and his involvement with all things Quaker, extraordinary. His life could be a full-length movie, yet I can only give you a glimpse of what he was all about. William Hubin, a meeting member, a George School teacher, and an author of Walton's obituary, writes, the educator, more than most of us, lives in the realm of imperfection. That is especially true of life in a boarding school where drafts from the windy corridors of the adolescent mind are unceasing. What or who could be more unfinished than the adolescent, so painfully conscious of his or her resentments and longings? Yet the tensions in a school community 
are also full of promise. An educator has to live with the young in the future while molding them in the present for the goals of maturity. What in later life is vaguely called hope tends for them to be certainty. George Walton spent his entire life in this exciting climate. There were moments of discouragement, but the focus on growth was never absent. His leadership in PYM and in Friends General Conference injected a note of spirituality into these assemblies that was the fruit of silent contemplations. Still, the authority that carried George Walton's presence never created an aloofness often associated with high office. He loved nothing more than spirited discussions. His vocabulary employed the question mark more frequently than the exclamation point. The demand of always remembering the future dominated most of George Walton's years. When he took the risk of inviting a sizable number of foreign teachers from Europe to his faculty, it was more than the calculated risk of which he used to speak. It was an act of faith to give an opening to untried strangers and his vision of the unity of all men everywhere moved him to do so. William Cuban writes, we who came from disturbed conditions must have been as awkward in speech and action as some of the students. George Walton and his wife, Emily, were tactful and sensitive guides in this strange milieu. And we newcomers soon realized we could not have found a better school community to let us grow into American life. It's natural when you're thinking about George Walsh and Walton to think, oh, he's the George School guy, but he was a member of Newtown Meeting. He's our guy too, so let's get to know him. I didn't know he would, went to Nazi Germany in December 1938 with AFSC founder Rufus Jones and Robert Yarnell. Rufus Jones wrote about their journey in our day in the German Gestapo. About the Nazis, he writes, our struggle is not with the people themselves, but with an intangible set of entrenched ideas. And against all odds, they, the Quakers, were granted permission to go in and provide assistance to the Jews. They were gone about a month. Shortly after he returned home, George Walton shared his experience is at the Mean House, which was packed with people from miles around. How do we know? It was covered on the front page of the Newtown Enterprise. I didn't know 10 years later in 1948, he would have a hand in healing the schism between the Orthodox and Hicksite Quakers. Their work was slow and methodical, but I think his whole life, especially his experience in Germany, prepared him for this moment. He worked toward finding the right words to help folks examine their own entrenched ideas and to consider with love a future together. Always committed to involving young people, he asked the Young Friends Group to research the reason for the original split. And they reported back that no one could really remember, which they took as a good sign that they would be able to find a way back. I didn't know he was involved with laying down the Quaker Book of Discipline and developing the first faith and practice published in 1955. He served as clerk of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting twice. And back home here in Newtown, he served as clerk of worship and ministry twice. He kept in touch with his students, attended weddings, funerals, and locally sharing a meal at quarterly meetings. Finally, Huben writes, critical though he could be at times, he had little patience with fault finders. George Walton invested his faith in the young and those who served them. Faith implies the taking of risks. Faith lives in the realm of tomorrow and of the future whose ultimate design is eternity itself. After his wife died in 1963, George moved into Friends boarding home. Six years later, in November 1969, 
while walking along Route 532, he was hit by a car and died. He had been on his way to an ecumenical meeting and lost his way. The next category of friends we'd like to dig into is those who serve with the American Friends Service Committee. To our knowledge, there are 15 friends in our graveyard who had an affiliation with AFSC. Some of them are Marie and Bill Burton, who worked together on three Mexican work camps in the 1950s. Lorraine and Bill Cleveland, who served overseas with AFSC and were the American co-leaders of the first Quaker youth pilgrimage to England in 1959. Grant and Ella Frazier worked together for AFSC for seven summers. During this time, they lived in Arizona. They had summer seminars for foreign students attending U.S. colleges, where the final week of the eight-week seminar was held on one of Arizona's Indian reservations, and it involved Native American elders, thus making all the participants feel out of their culture. How wonderful that Grant and Ella's sons, Bob and David, got to observe it all as staff children. Helen and Jim Lovett joined AFSC in 1948, traveling to the Henan province in China, where they helped to run a hospital. They spent three years in China with AFSC. And now that you've gotten to know some friends who are involved in AFSC, we'd like to dig even deeper into some friends who served at the dawn of the organization. Dr. Jesse Packer and his wife, Mary Pankost Packer. Remember when Wendy said I added hundreds of people on findagrave.com? It's a crowdsourced website, meaning whoever creates the entry is the only person who can approve edits or content suggested by someone else. Over the summer, I received an email from someone making several suggestions about Jesse Packer. They knew where he was born in Ohio, okay, approved. They said he was a veteran of World War I. I knew that wasn't true. And I thought, why does this person think that? So I went on to fold3.com, which provides access to military records. His draft card was different from anyone else's I had seen before. It turns out that in World War I, there were three types of draft cards that corresponded to three different registration time periods. The first registration took place from June 5th 1917 to July 4th, 1918. This is the only time period that asked the following question. Do you claim exemption from the draft? If yes, explain. Jesse completes his card on June 5th, 1917, the first day, and writes, yes, Religious Beliefs Society of Friends. That's when I started thinking, is Jesse a conscientious objector? This is news. I continue on the Fold3 website and I'm looking at all the items relevant to Jesse Packer. I see a shipping manifest under the Army Transport Service with his name on it. The document officially refers to the people they are transporting as casual civilians. I have no idea what that means. I stare at the paper some more and see cost of passage to be charged ARC. All of a sudden it occurs to me, this must mean American Red Cross, but still there's no other information. Then I think, well, he, he must have a passport, right? I bet there's information I can find there. So back on Ancestry, and sure enough, there it is. On the first page of his passport, it asks, what country are you going to? And what is the object of work? And he writes, <clears throat> France and reconstruction work for the American Friends Committee. He further states, he's scheduled to leave on board the Rochambeau 
on September 1st, 1917. On page two of his passport is, is where you have a person you know vouch for you. It's the called the identification section. Who signs for Jesse? Henry Cadbury, one of the founders of AFSC, who he's known all of six weeks. It's dated August 27th, 1917. The third page is completed by the draft board and they restate the grounds of Jesse's exemption being his religious beliefs, then continue to say the war department has no objection to issue of a passport. That's dated August 28th. And away he goes. Years ago, when Wendy and I first started collecting information on everyone in the graveyard, we collected the usual birth dates, death dates, and burial dates. And if we had it, marriage dates too. On one of the documents, it listed that Jesse married Perry, Mary Pancoast in Paris, France. We thought, how romantic to be married in Paris, not noticing what was going on in the world when that wedding took place. They got married August 27th, 1918. So now it's time to take a look at Mary Pancos. So back on Ancestry.com, I find her passport to France. And what does this document tell us? It asks, what is the object of her visit? She writes, her occupation is social settlement worker with American Friends Reconstruction. In addition to having several people vouch for her, her aunt, Francine Haynes, letters of support from George Walton and George Nutt are also listed there. There are several letters that accompany this passport. There is one from the executive secretary of AFSC certifying that she is a duly appointed member of the American Friends Reconstruction Unit of the Red Cross to engage in relief and reconstruction work in France and is under orders of this committee to sail for France as soon as possible. So Mary went over to France as Mary Panthost. So she gets married over there and she needs a new passport that sports her married name, right? We find that on Ancestry too. This time with Jesse as the person to vouch for her stating he's known her for 13 years. He's 28, she's 27. So 28, 27, subtract 13 equals 15, 14, 15 and 14 years old. Where did they meet? George School. I'm curious about Mary and want to know more. I enter her name and Quaker records in the search bar and find recorded in her meetings minutes are Jesse and Mary's intention to marry. The meeting believed they were to be married at the American Embassy on or about August 28th. However, they were married where their meeting for worship was usually held, either in or around the hostel. How do I know that? Hold that thought, and we'll get back to that in a minute. So I'm gonna pause right here and confess I had very little knowledge about AFSC. So I go over to the meeting house and stand in front of the library shelves and wonder if we have any books about AFSC. We do, and a lot of them. There were several to choose from, but for some reason I was drawn to this one. We Answered with Love by Nancy Learned Haynes. This is an unusual book about a young man from Harvard Leslie Hodgson and a committed pacifist, and Mary Peabody, a young political activist from Radcliffe, who had just started dating. In 1918, many of his classmates were enlisting or serving in the Student Army, Army Training Corps. Leslie wouldn't have any of it. His faith called him to be of service to people who were suffering and to be of service in a practical way. It was through Mary that he found out about AFSC and the reconstruction unit. He applied, was accepted, and in this book describes much of what this man, young, young man experienced, including over 100 letters exchanged between Leslie and Mary 
and their budding romance. Through this book, we begin to get a sense of what life must have been like for our Jesse Packer. In fact, the third chapter in this book is called On Board the Rochambeau. And what are the chances I picked up the book that will have a big surprise for me on page 121? Leslie writes, We had a Quaker wedding here the other day. A Mary Pancos married a Dr. Jesse Packer, to whom she had been engaged in America. He describes the ceremony, the vows, the silence, and the reception where there was ice cream and cake. Thee cannot realize what those words mean to us here, thousands of miles from American freezers and ovens. The food was delicious, but some of us had not time to meditate upon the wedding. We left immediately for the station to unload American wounded from a train into ambulances. Jesse worked at several hospitals, but spent the most time at Chateau du Hospital, where he worked closely with a Dr. James Babbitt. They worked in crowded and strenuous conditions. We assumed that Mary was assigned in the, to the same hospital, providing support in any way she could. So what else can I find out about these two? We know that in 1919, they returned home to Newtown where they lived at 231 South Chancellor Street. How do I know that? the 1920 census. You can see in this house has two entrances, one for his home and the other for the medical practice. Moving on to the 1930 census, we see they've moved into a larger house down the road to 35 South Chancellor Street. And there are three children now living in the house with four-year-old adopted daughter, Jane, a 20-month adopted son, John, and a two-month-old, two David, not adopted. There's no mention of Mary. Where's Mary? I took a quick look in our records to discover baby David was born January 11th, and Mary died 13 days later on January 24th at age 38 from, I'm assuming, complications from childbirth. Surprisingly, ancestry and newspapers.com do not have all the newspapers, and I'm frustrated that I cannot find an obituary online. This is what takes me to the Newtown Historic Society on Mercer Street, as this is the only place that has the local newspaper, the Newtown Enterprise, on microfilm. The obituary talks of her service in AFSC and that she was an active member of many organizations of the town seeking to improve the community. Obituaries during this period were not like they are today. They were written after the funeral and mentioned those who spoke during the service. Three of the speakers are people mentioned here today, Sarah Griscom, George Nutt, and George Walton. I don't even know these people and I'm heartbroken for them. As informative as the obituary was, it wasn't enough for me. I felt left hanging. I needed more of an acknowledgement of her passing. Meeting for business minutes rarely reflect the events of the day, and that was the case here. I asked my friends at the Newtown Historic Society for help, and they delivered. They found her mentioned on the front page of the Enterprise the week after her obituary was listed. It captures the heartbreak. Listen, profound sorrow was expressed by the members in full realization of the irreparable loss that the union, the organization she belonged, has sustained by the death of Mary P. Packer, who during her life in Newtown was such a faithful and valuable member. So Jesse's left with three children under five and his wife's aunt stepping in to assist with children Luckily, a few years, years later, our Jesse marries again to another woman named Mary. Taking a look at the 1940 census, we see the children are now 14, 11, and 10, and they've added two kids of their own, 
Mary and Richard, ages six and five. You know, they sent all their kids to Jorah's school. Their youngest, Richard, Dick, is still alive and living in Connecticut. Fun fact, he was a member of the 1956 U.S. soccer team at the Summer Olympics in Australia. Jesse and Mary had a wonderful life. He loved his family, understood the sacrifices his father made by moving to Newtown from Ohio solely so that he and his sister could attend George School. He meets his future bride there and served together in France where they worked for the American Friends Service Committee and in the middle of a war got married. He was a conscientious objector. He lived his values. He was the town doctor and continued to make house calls long after the practice fell by the wayside. He served as the president of the Bucks County Medical Society and was the doctor at Friends Home and was loved by so many. Mary died on September 22nd, 1970, and 20 days later, Jesse died on October 12th, 1970, a few weeks shy of 80. Wendy and I love knowing that Jesse is buried between his two Marys. Many of our friends lived close enough to walk to the meeting house. Let's take a stroll around Newtown Borough and visit where these friends lived. Iva Swigard John was 21 days old in 1914 when she died of whooping cough. Her family buried her in one of the plots in the family lot that the meeting had given them. The family was listed as living here in the 1920 census, but moved away not long afterward, never to return. Jane Ray and Ernie Millard resided here. Jane Ray was clerk of the meeting and Ernie was mayor of Newtown and one of the founders of Newtown Historic Association. In 1921, Job Hollingshead came to Newtown as a journeyman clock and watchmaker and rented this property. He married Sarah Feaster soon after moving to Newtown and he and Sarah raised their six children there. This is where Effie Carver lived with her son, Ken. In 1943, he was killed in a workplace accident at Bristol's Roman Haas plant. Effie died nine months after burying her son. Some may recognize this as the house next door to our Bancrofts. Isaac, Anne, and Sarah Griscom, three unmarried siblings, lived here together. In 1912, Sarah was the clerk of Philadelphia Yearly Meeting. This house is on the Newtown Holiday House Tour this year. Robert and Elsie Cook lived here from 1922 to 1968. This is where William Cooper, George School's maintenance employee lived. We'd like to finish our talk today by digging into some of our more memorable friends. Viola Alma Twining Torbert, and later Twining again, was born in December 1770 and was the youngest of David Twining and Elizabeth Lewis Twining's four daughters. She was considered her father's pet and was a bit of a troublemaker. Now this was the family who took in Edward Hicks when he was a young boy and he considered Beulah to be a sister. His description of her is an example of why he was considered such a great orator and writer. She was certainly calculated to be greatly good, but the improper indulgence of her eccentric self-will threw her out of her orbit. And instead of being a fixed star in the firmament of God's power that shines with new ascensions of glory and brightens to all eternity, she was more like the comet that takes an eccentric course among the constellations of heaven and shines or even dazzles only for a moment 
and then sinks into oblivion. She reads novels, much to the consternation of her parents, although her father did keep the township library in the house. In May of 1791, she married a young Presbyterian doctor named Samuel Torbert, and in 1792 was read out of meeting for marrying outside of the faith and in secret. Edward Hicks provided an illuminating description of Dr. Torbert. She married a young Presbyterian doctor whose only recommendation was a handsome exterior, while there was nothing within to correspond with that pleasing appearance without, and hence the tie was too feeble to hold, and she left him with the same self-will and determination in which she married him. About the time Beulah got married, her father died, leaving her a sizable estate. She also realized that the marriage had been a terrible mistake, and in 1796, she filed for divorce. The process to obtain a divorce at that time was difficult and contentious and went all the way to the Connecticut Supreme Court for its resolution. The divorce cost her dearly. However, over time, she paid off all her debts and became reinstated as a useful member of the Society of Friends. She died in November 1826 at the age of 55. If Martha and Phoebe Huff were alive today, they would be living in what is now known as State Street Kitchen. In fact, if you walk across the street, you'll see their house is still there with State Street Kitchen on the left and David Witchell home on the front and the psychologist occupying the second floor. Obituaries back in the day were individualized, not cookie cutter, and in some cases, Information is shared there that no one else knows. I found their obituaries in the Newtown Enterprise. They write, It is not often that two persons die in one house within less than 24 hours of each other, but this was the case with the Huff sisters on South State Street. Martha Huff, aged 75, died at 7 o'clock last Seventh-day morning of pneumonia after a week's illness. And on first day morning at six o'clock, Phoebe Huff, aged 81, died after having been confined to her room for months due to her advanced age. A double funeral was held on third day morning and the sisters were interred in one grave in the gra graveyard at Newtown Friends Meeting. That was information we did not know. We thought they were buried separately, side by side. Michael Hutchinson Jenks, or Judge Jenks, as he was known, was closely connected with the public affairs of Bucks County for most of his life. He was born in Falls Township in May 1795, and in 1830, he began his long and illustrious political career. He held the positions of county commissioner, county treasurer, and associate judge of the Court of Common Pleas for Bucks County. He served as a justice of the peace, was a chief burgess or mayor of Newtown, and was elected as a Whig to the 28th United States Congress. Judge Jenks also had a soft romantic side. He was happily married four times, and he wrote love poems to each of his wives, and published them in a series of books. He had just received a shipment of these books when he fell, probably due to a stroke. Two days later, he died calmly and peacefully at the age of 72. He was buried a few days later between his first and second wives. As I said, Judge Jenks was married four times. He was married to his first wife, Mary, for 25 years. She died in 1846. In 1848, he married another Mary, who died one year later. 
two years after her death, he married his third wife, Anne, only to have her die after three years of marriage. He lists her occupation as the best of wives on her death certificate. Finally, in 1856, he married his fourth and final wife, Sarah, to whom he was married until his death in 1867. Sharon has a book of his poems and she's going to read one of his poems to you. This is called My Second Mary. I wept when she left me and often weep yet when I look on the ground where she's sleeping. And wrong may it be to shed tears of regret, but I loved her and cannot help weeping. She has left me alone to seek for content through the balance of time yet remaining. With a spirit bowed down and happiness rent, but as a man, I submit uncomplaining. I oft smile with the crowd and light with the gay and my countenance indicate gladness. Yet the smile is fictitious, soon passing away, succeeded by gloom and by sadness. Humanity's bark through the ocean of life meets with winds and with waves oft contrary. And hard is the blast to sustain when a wife is torn from the earth such as Mary. I wept when she left me and often weep yet when I look on the gra grave where she's sleeping. And wrong may it be to shed tears of regret that I loved her and cannot help weeping. Garrett Van Sant Hunter led a colorful life. He was born in Newtown, fought in the Civil War, and served as a conductor for the Pennsylvania Railroad. For 17 years, he traveled all over the U.S. and Canada as a circus attache for Barnum and Bailey. After his retirement in July 1897, he became a resident of Friends Home when it was located in Dr. Letty Smith's house, and he is considered to be the very first boarder at Friends Home. After being bedridden for two and a half years, he died in November 1920 at the age of 85. Bob Frazier, son of Ella and Grant Frazier, was a George School graduate and professor at Bucks County Community College. He was also a former clerk of worship and ministry. The folks at the college, they loved him and described him as a man of great gifts, profound modesty, passionate convictions, and deep generosity. Bob was the director of the Learning Center at Bucks and was described as both a gifted teacher and remarkable poet. After he passed away, the college established an annual po poetry competition that bears his name. His life, teaching, and poetry offers a remarkable example of courage, dignity, and grace. From his Memorial Minute, we learn that Bob loved truth in its broadest sense and loved language as the best tool available for the expression of truth so that all could better understand the nature and will of God. Well, that's all the digging we're going to do today, but... There are 614 burials in our graveyard and 614 stories to tell. We've shared just a fraction of the stories we know about the folks buried here. Our hope is that you feel more connected to those who have gone before us. Who we are as a meeting rests on the decisions they made in the past. We stand on their shoulders with love and gratitude. As you can see, Wendy and I have deep affection for the folks buried here, and we are grateful for the opportunity to share their stories with you this morning. We are not finished. There is much more to tell. Thanks for your attention, and we'll see you next year for more Digging into the Graveyard.